Hey guys, I want to welcome you to an edition of our R&B Fresh podcast, where we focus and spotlight all things British talent. So I'm interviewing Erica James, who is um, a British um, um, songwriter and producer. And she's got a new EP coming out called Here She Comes. So it'll be interesting talking to Erica, just understanding the difference between making R&B and making music actually here in the UK and sort of her hopes and aspirations. Hello. Yes. Hi, Erica. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you? Are we recording? Yes. Okay. No, but it, it, it gets edited, not to worry. I just... I, I, I've had a, one incident out of uh, 200 where I didn't record, and, and, and so I edited, so I don't just put it all out. <laughs> That's all right. Got it, got it. Nice uh, to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you as well. Um, but yeah, okay, no, we can, we can, we can, we can go in, into it now. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to um, highlight and understand is um, the music scene here in the UK. Um especially for talents who haven't been signed to major labels and stuff. So it'd be interesting to hear sort of your story and your journey and, and, and um, how one makes it as a recording artist here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if we start off from the beginning, I mean, where, where, where you, so you, were you born and raised? Yeah. So I was born in Tooting in South London. Okay. I'm a South Londoner <laughs> to and fro. Um, but at the age of five, my family and I, we moved to, at first it was New York and then New Jersey. Okay. Um, and then we moved back to London. I think they just couldn't get enough of London. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm sure there's some, some other like stuff, but you know, the only place I've lived other than South London was New Jersey in New York. Okay. So I'm from South London and I'm currently based in, yeah, in South London, in Crystal Palace. Area. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to music, I mean, how when, when did the music bug hit you? It hit me from a very early age. I'm the youngest of like three, okay. and my sisters would be doing every. I always say every outreach community talent show going to South <laughs> London, they were a part of. So back in the day when there was like Choice FM, okay, uh, they would do like all sorts of talent shows. So I always like grew up watching my sisters like rehearse and do choreography and sing in the living room, whether it was to like Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson or Prince or Sync, We were like obsessed with NSYNC and, and Britney Spears. I would always just watch them. So I think that's where it first started. But even my parents, like they were like young people as well, married professionals who would watch Top of the Pops. And it was like their tradition to buy these VH VHS tapes, if anyone remembers those things. Um, and when Top of the Pops was on, they would say, listen, it's on. And then they would run and record it. And, you know, I just grew up watching a lot of music and listening to a lot of music as well. But I'm British Nigerian. So uh -huh. music was always treated as a part time passion and love. So it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I felt like, you know what, here's my degree because I study journalism. I have a BA in journalism. Okay. It's my degree. I'm going to go and start pursuing music. But even then, I can't help it. I'm a multi hyphenate millennial. So I dip my hands in various things. I'm an assistant producer. I work at Radio One, One Extra, and Asian Network as an assistant producer. But I also sing and write songs as well. So it's hit me from the very beginning. I've always loved music and okay. always wanted to know how to I play piano, I play guitar, electric, acoustic. And yeah, I just love writing songs and doing music. So you mentioned something, oh, you said a lot of very interesting things, but what was something that really caught me was the fact that I was also British Nigerian. And so, uh, you know with <laughs> growing up, but, um, but unlike yourself, I actually went to secondary school in, uh, to, in Nigeria and went to okay. university in America. So I, I do wonder what the difference is for yourself growing up, having Nigerian parents and how that shapes the direction you go trying to pursue a creative um, passion like music. Was it, were, were they very much, okay, you know, you need to get a professional job, we don't mind you singing on the side, or was like, well, if you, if you have the talent, we'll support you all the way? 
a little bit of both, but I definitely think it was like the former for sure. Um, and the older I've got, the more compassion I've had. If you can imagine a lot of our parents started from scratch. And I think that things such as being, and, I, and this isn't just like for Nigerians or Ghanaians. I've spoken to a lot of people of like Asian, East Asian backgrounds. And it tends to be like, I think a cultural thing of stability, financial stability. And so I can see the love and I could see the care in which it was kind of challenging for them. So they may have chosen something that was just a little bit more reliable, but definitely I think in time, it was so worth it because I do have my degree and I do have something I can quote unquote fall back on. But yeah, I don't resent them for it too much. Um, I could see now in time that it was with love and, and with care. And to be fair, I remember my parents pulling up to my sister's school because I was in the secondary school and my sisters were in the sixth form of that same school, pulling up and taking us to see Destiny's Child do signings. So they always knew we had a love of music and they always wanted us to do that. But I definitely think that being that it was so difficult for them in the 80s, they wanted to give us that same thing of listen. And I think at the time there, were, there weren't as many routes to success that they felt. They probably felt like it would be safer to be a doctor or to be a lawyer or to be something. I think I, even me being a journalist was considered kind of like an art, even within the university I was in. Yeah. But essentially it worked because I'm now got so many bows to like my hat um, and it's never too late. So I'm, I'm happy that I can do music. And I don't think I would have been ready at the time. Like I was trying to be a child star. I remember going on some audition when I was 11 that ended up being like not what it said. That's for the like the memoirs. Um, so I was trying to be like a Raven Simone kind of teen pop star thing and to mm -hmm. be honest with you I don't think I was even singing as well as I do now or writing as well as I do now I have more life to me so I have things to write so I just think it's meant to to be okay now when it comes to your you mentioned writing and actually singing um you know most of us who are used to hearing the stories and backstories from American artists would, would hear about how they you know, 90% of them all grew up singing and, and playing instruments in church. And then that's how they stumbled on becoming recording artists. Mm -hmm. For yourself growing up in England, uh, London, as you mentioned, how did you actually start to hone your singing and, and learning um, your, to find your voice? Um, that's a great question. I think for me, it wasn't so much singing in like church. Like I barely went. It was more of... Like, I guess through osmosis and a lot of the singers that I listened to, they grew up singing in church. So whether it was Mary J. Blige, whether it was Jodeci, whether it was my own parents, because my parents, my grandfather on my mother's side, and my mum's father was like a pastor of a church. And my grandma, her mother, played the organ in the church. And my mum grew up singing in the church. But mm. so that was still like something that was really important in terms of gospel. But um I think for a lot of my generation, we grew up singing in assembly. We went to Catholic schools. Okay. So that was the kind of way that I was singing or you follow your friend to like go to like youth, you know, things. And then you're singing there. Mm -hmm. But for me, my, my, I guess, cause I know the lineage of like Aretha Franklin singing in the church or Roberta Flack singing in like the Catholic church. For me, my singing was just buying records and singing it. Um, I was always quite shy, so I didn't really follow my sisters into doing competitions, etc. Mm -hmm. It was me just literally closing my door, listening to Monica and Aaliyah and Brandy, who I loved. I remember mm -hmm. moving to America and it was like Brandy everywhere, Cinderella, Moesha, yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way I kind of got into it. Just, you know, kind of fantasizing and thinking about if I did this one day, how would it look? And also the kind of music that I was into wasn't really what girls like we were listening to in Southeast London. Like I was listening because I grew up partly in America to Shania Twain and Faith Hill. And that just really wasn't what I felt I was meant to be listening to. But then again, I would listen to Brandy and I would listen to Aaliyah, but I would listen to so many things. I listened to Led Zeppelin and Nirvana. And I could speak about Prince the same way I could speak about like Robert Plant. And so yeah, that was just the way that I just started to learn, just listening to those records again and again, 
listening to Brandy and Marvin Gaye again and again. This was before mm. like really Google hit when he mm. had Ark Jeeves and Ark Jeeves had like 50 pages. So I just used to record, me and my sisters used to just listen to the radio with our cassettes and press, you know, record and just listen to the songs and write the lyrics we thought that we were hearing. I remember I messed up sitting up in my room by Brandy so many times. I look back at the lyrics and I'm like, oh, no, that wasn't what she was saying. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the way. What about the, um? because you mentioned as you started off that you play both the guitar and the keyboards and how did those skills develop? I'm self-taught. So as a kid, I would always push, you know, to do singing lessons. I would always push to do piano lessons and I would do those things. I'd use my pocket money to go and do them. But they would try to get me to like learn show tunes and things, mm -hmm. <laughs> which if, you know, Hallie was like the Little Mermaid at that time, I probably would have cared to, to know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to know that. I knew from a young age that I wanted to learn how to play like Lauren Hill and Killing Me Softly and so I took, I would take bits of what I was learning and then I would just play that again and again and again. And that's the same thing I did and I do today. And I just build up on that. So I'm I'm self-taught. I'll just hear a song, play it a couple of times. I'll probably go on YouTube and look at a tutorial mm. um, and just learn it myself. And that just came from like being a young kid listening to Prince and seeing that he could play and write everything and same thing with Jodeci. One of my heroes, musical heroes, is a guy called Devante Swing. And knowing that he can write and play and produce. And my hero also is Missy Elliott. So a lot of the singers I would listen to and rappers I would listen to, singers, they would play their own stuff. And so I just would mimic and do the same and just, I guess, let the soul kind of just dictate everything from that. How did, which instrument do you normally use if you're writing songs? I use the guitar. Yeah, okay. well, definitely. It starts off as an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. or I'll play like a lick on the piano and hum a melody. It doesn't matter where I am, if I'm on the train, Uber, if I get an idea, I'll like literally hum into my phone. They're probably looking like she's this crazy person. Mm -hmm. But because I've like lost melodies before and mm -hmm. I don't know, I just feel like if I don't do something with it, God is going to take that idea, <laughs> and whatever you pray to or don't pray to and give it to somebody else like I'm pretty sure I've heard a melody I was thinking of on the radio on someone's <laughs> <laughs> so I just tried to capture it and I'm always walking around with like a notepad and oh. yeah for sure but how easy did songwriting come compared to I mean you're mentioning being able to be self-taught learning the instruments but then when it comes to actually writing a meaningful song how was that transition um, fairly easy. I've always been one with words. I don't know. I love astrology. So I think it's a Sagittarius thing <laughs> to be like a wordsmith and, you know, being that I'm a journalist as well and a writer, words just kind of flow through me. I know how to access my emotions easily. I'm quite an empath. So I feel other people's emotions. Sometimes I have to shut off, which is why I like to spend sometimes a lot of time on my own, especially if I'm doing music. So I would say that it's fairly easy. I was probably writing a bit earlier than playing instruments. So mm. I'd write like poetry a lot. And, you know, if you have like, you know, if you see a beautiful sunset or a rainbow, or I went to the beach, I would just write that as a child and write it into like poetry. But I definitely think it changed when I started listening to Tupac, actually. That's actually mm. a big influence of mine. My sister's they're about four or five years older than me. So I remember with my middle sister, we shared a room, but with my older sister, she had her own room and she had the biggest picture of Tupac you'd ever seen. <laughs> it was the one where he had thug life on his stomach <laughs> yeah. and his drawers. And I remember my dad was like, why do you guys have naked, half naked men on your wall? <laughs> you know, cause my, my middle sister had like a picture of Tyrese on her wall. And <laughs> dad was just like, oh my God, there's two, there's two drinks. Uh, why don't you have me on your wall? And we were like, it'll be weird if we had like our dad on our wall. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, funny. Um, and I just remember listening to the songs that they would play in their room and, you know, listening to Tupac and thinking, no, this is pretty cool, but are they going through something? Because this is very deep. And then I hit 15 and then I understood, okay, now I understand the, the lyrics. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I think Tupac definitely, and also like a lot of rap, a lot of Little Kim and Ludacris really taught me about wordplay. 
Mm. I'll always tell this to people when I was, you know, doing English literature in high school and learning about sonnets and Shakespeare, Mm. I was simultaneously listening to Tupac. And I think those two things just kind of made me the writer that I am. So even now, like I write plays, I'm working on a one woman play that has music in it. And I just think those two things just show the richness and the depth of our culture black culture okay i think that that's what i'm always trying to to express through my music and the actual taking all this you know playing your instruments um your songwriting and showcasing it to the public how did the transition to doing live shows and things like that happen yeah so in between college i would just find opportunities to sing with people. I started off as like a backing vocalist for a couple uh, independent and some major, I think there was one girl that was signed. So I'd always kind of play the back. I always like to observe what's going on before Mm -hmm. I do things. So being a backing vocalist was my way of doing that. And like I said, growing up as the youngest of three, I was always into like harmonies. So, and growing up listening to Destiny's Child as well and, and Vogue, I always knew how to fit my my voice into things mm. um and so yeah that's just how I got I got started I would do shows I played the 100 club as a backing vocalist and a couple other like 12 bar was my first solo show mm. I don't think 12 bar is around these days but I'm a huge Jeff Buckley fan so knowing that he performed at 12 bar I was just like Jeff bless bless this performance <laughs> <laughs> and that was interesting I hired like a drummer I was playing my guitar and wow. you know it was just amazing literally my friends but also the people from the bar we were bothering everyone from the bar to come <laughs> in so <to, to> <laughs> it was like the black white stripes so you should have been called the black stripes <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun it was really enjoyable but like I said you know, this industry sometimes can be a little bit, mm. so I just always focused on my education and I always, you know, I did writing and radio and just got stuck kind of in TV and became a researcher and then graduated and then became an assistant producer. So music has always been kind of like a, a part-time thing for me, but I've never stopped recording. I never stopped writing. I just wanted to wait for the industry especially over here to kind of open up a little bit more, especially for people that look like me and black women that not only do, you know, hip hop, but also alternative music. So I feel like, yeah, I've been just feeling a lot more inspired, which is why I released and made my EP Here She Comes. And I released it not too long ago. Okay. I mean, just before we get to the EP, what is the the situation with the music industry here in the UK when it comes to um, independent artists, people who, especially if you're, if you're black, um, because unlike the U S where they have um, a large urban market, where it comes to where there's radio, television channels and, and a rich history of promoting um, black music doesn't what I've noticed is not necessarily the same here in the UK. Although one extra is a glo- is a national station, um, it seems as if maybe grime and um, seems to be a little bit more pushed, and and some sort of um, independent uh, artists who are signed to labels. What are the avenues for someone like yourself trying to make headway here in the UK? Absolutely, I mean, definitely. I think if someone, if an alien was to come down because they don't exist (laughs) come down and you know you know what is the industry like they'll just think that there's nothing but grime here which is the truth at the end of the day I come from the grime generation I remember it when it was channel U and that then it was channel aka and I remember seeing Chipmunk perform for the first time thinking he's amazing or nice called Chip um, and so, yeah, I love grime and a lot of the things I do. I was on a song with two great artists called Atlanta May and Key Artiste, Check Out Feelings. It's on all platforms. And I was rapping, you know, so grime I love. And I think we need to continue to support it, especially women who do grime. Um, but I definitely think that like anything, you can be pigeonholed and put in a box. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, this industry speaks not black or white. It speaks green and I money. 
And I think mm-hmm. that when people see some things working, they'll just keep on pushing it. And they tend to really, and this isn't directed to one radio station because I think the issue is bigger than the radio. I think it's just about the a r and the teams behind it. We don't have our uptowns anymore too much. We don't really have our La faces. We don't have enough people that are like an Andre Harrell that will go to Queens or go to the Bronx or go to these inner cities to pull out a Mary J. Blige or will take a chance on four black boys from North Carolina. Like, you know, they did Jodeci and we have these great talent over here, but that bridge is just really missing. So I think that what the internet is doing is just allowing everyone to do it yourself. I had fantasies of, you know, jumping on a table like Usher and singing for an A&R and then they sign you and woo, you know, (laughs) everything is just, you know, peachy keen, but it's not that anymore. It seems like people really want us and want our aesthetic, but they don't want it from us, it feels sometimes. Um, And so you really just have to decide whether you're going to let that get you down and you're going to be in a funk or if you're going to use it to your benefit and be that underdog and still pursue music and take it to the highest level. And that's where I'm at. And that's where I think a lot of black and brown artists are at where we're like, okay, back in the day, they used to do the Motown thing and then they would do the etiquette coaching and then they would put you in this and they'll make you a star or you can do it yourself. And I think for me, what shifted is looking at how the Americans, especially the independent, but also here, I think Stormzy is someone who is just highly successful, comes from South London, like I do. And uh, he pushed and pushed and pushed and got to a certain place where he was doing shows. And then the industry were knocking down the door to sign him. And now he's signed to, I think, a black label, 0207, I think. Um, And the same thing in America with Chance the Rapper. He was... I think he's still independent and distributes his music. So that's what inspired me to just be like, you know what, instead of waiting for anyone to put money behind me, mm-hmm. let me go get me a good job in TV, which I have, mm-hmm. um, and use that money to buy the equipment that I need, learn mm-hmm. how to mix and master and produce, which I do. I already know how to write songs, but I chose to do covers, which I'll talk about later if you ask. Mm-hmm. Um, and just don't let anyone stop you. Book your own shows set up your own shows, work with other people in the area that are artists as well. Atlanta's from not too far where I live. And so, you know, there's avenues to do what you love and to do music. And I think even with the top high selling artists, these streaming numbers are really wicked with what they're, you know, producing and the money they're getting. So everyone is getting paid doing shows and doing tours and making their own videos, which I'll be doing soon. So yeah, that's just the way it is and how it is in America, being that I live there and live here, I can see the differences. But I think essentially every independent artist, wherever you are, is just feeling the spirit of we've got to do it ourselves and put it on TikTok or go and do shows. Just be self-reliant, self-belief and self-determination is essentially what you need to have in any industry. I mean, the um, op- the social media and the internet has made it possible for um artists to do their own thing you know you can you don't necessarily need to use abbey road to record an album anymore you can record it from home and uh, anyway. yeah i know it's costly you don't need hype williams to direct your video you could just use mm-hmm. your phone to do it so and you don't need sony or um universal to distribute your music because you can just upload it on one service and it just sends it out to all the streaming services and it's out there that so that's great from one point but the the challenge then becomes well if everyone is doing it how does one filter through what is good and what isn't good and as you mentioned about the a and r and you mentioned about the batuk labels it meant that if you were signed to uptown you you knew that Uptown were behind you. There was the Uptown brand. So those who are familiar with the label say, well, that's probably a trusted brand. We'll 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 give this a try. For real. Whereas without that sort of stamp of approval, it's almost like a a hit and miss type of thing. That's true. So I then go back to saying, as a recording artist, what is then the the the, the dream and aspiration? Is it to be able to make a living recording music? Or is that, look, the music's in me, I love making it, 
And even if I don't get much mo- any money from it, I just want to be able to put it out there and and just shoot, just bless the world with it. What is it for yourself, Erica? Well, as a Nigerian, hell no. <laughs> hell no. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. More than a Destiny Child song. I mean, I get that that's people's passion. And, that you know, I think that that's the truth. I think you have to manage your expectations and be realistic. Mm-hmm. One of the perks of those of those big labels and is the distribution. It's the level of marketing that you get. Yeah, you know, People think Prince was like anti, you know, record labels to some extent yes but he also knew for new artists uh the distribution that comes with record labels is phenomenal Mm -hmm. so you know it is not about eradicating them and it's about them listening and for us to start our own labels you know for us to start our own record companies etc so yeah I, i was watching ed sheeran's documentary the other day um or just yesterday um, I won't say the brand. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I just remember him saying the same thing. Like you work so hard on your music when you're writing it. Why don't you want people to play it? And why don't you want to perform it for as many people as possible? That's what I want. I want to sell out these stadiums that these rock artists and pop artists are selling out because, you know, you have to believe that you have the talent to do so. So absolutely. And I feel very emboldened and happy when I see independent artists like a Stormzy, well, not now, but when he was, you know, independent and Chance and so many other people Mm -hmm. selling out these stadiums. And it's, it goes back to the power of the song. You know, when you're listening to Forever My Lady, I was listening to Jodie C all morning. Mm -hmm. When you're listening to Stay, when you're listening to Cry For You, it's the power of a song, you know, that can make people just, yeah, I've been watching the Beyonce live stream, like everyone, you know, of, of Renaissance in Sweden this week. Mm-hmm. People are like literally getting engaged, actually getting engaged in front of like Tyler Perry and Jay-Z and Little yeah. Blue Ivy in the audience. But this is the kind of music that Beyonce solicits, key moments of people's lives. When you think about people getting married to Joe to see Love You For Life, like, that's what I'm thinking of when I'm writing that someone might listen to this if they've lost someone or if they are feeling someone or if they're shy or if they're feeling, you know, I'm always thinking about that. So whether you're using social media to, to promote your music, I just can't lose the soul um, of why I'm doing it and, and what I'm doing it for. And so I think that will resonate. Um, but yeah, you just have to produce really great music and think about the quality of what you're bringing out and, also be relentless. You know, Ed Sheeran, if his friends were doing one show a week, he would do three a week. But then again, I can flag the privileges certain artists have over other artists and certain doors, certain things open up where you look a certain way. But essentially, I just always try to remember the hustle and the grind and remember where I want to go and really stay focused on my goals because it's so easy to blow you know, like with the leaf in the wind going one way and the other, you just really have to stay focused. And so, yeah, you need to, and we all need to independently make back everything that we are spending to get our music out there. And so, yeah. yeah but you mentioned that you focus on doing covers at this moment in time, as opposed to showcasing your own written music. And why is that? Yeah, well, just for clarification, I've put my music out that I've written, like I said, with Feelings, with Atlanta, that was my original work. Um, I tested the water a lot on SoundCloud and did some really great numbers, but I wanted as my introduction to music for me to really pay homage to the music that I like. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think during the pandemic, I just suffered really bad writer's block. Like I just didn't really feel like really going there. So instead of me just sitting on that, I just said, no, let me, write music because like many of us there were so many changes and losses that were happening I really just had to say you know what let me zoom in and center into the music that lifts me up and so I covered everything from like Willow meet me at our spot to like Rebel Yell by Billy Idol to a song that I love by an art alternative band called the Yeah Yeah Yeahs called Despair to In Excess like it was just a bit of like a silent like joy for myself to just be singing these songs that I love 
Mm-hmm. And I always say they're like my adoptive songs or they're like my surrogate songs. I didn't make them, but I carried them the nine months, you know, because <laughs> it feels like I'd written them. Um, and it just was a way for me to just free myself a little bit. And then when I released it and just hearing it, hearing people talk about it, it's called Here She Comes. It just felt like, yes, this is the feeling that I needed to now write again. And I've been writing. And so there's more coming, more original music coming. But if you want to hear original music, check out Feelings. I'm rapping on there for like a whole minute. I just go mm-hmm. crazy. And also on SoundCloud as well, Prophets of Rock. You'll hear like all the songs that I've written. But to be fair, there's more coming. So I'm excited about that. Okay. Uh, what, what what is the what is Prophet of Rock? So I know that, that seems to be your is it um, um, umbrella company or what, what is it? Absolutely, it's my it's a copyrighted production company, Prophets of Rock. It started off when I was in university. Um, I was a DJ in uni, and I thought, gosh, what can I? What genre can I cover? I knew people would think I would do R and B, so I said I want to do the rock and roll station. I grew up listening to a bunch of rock DJs like Howard Stone. I know I can't really say that now, but at the time, <laughs> um, I just loved the whole shock rock DJ thing. And so that's what I did. And I just thought to myself, profits. Hmm, okay. I like spirituality, not necessarily religion, but spirituality. And then I love rock and roll as well. And I especially love it because we are so in and around it. Rock and roll. If people don't know newsflash, ding, 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 was invented by black people. Little Richard is the architect of rock. And so I wanted to merge those two things. And so that's how I got Prophets of Rock. And I was a rock radio DJ throughout. And then when I graduated, I just said I didn't want to let it go. So I turned it into a YouTube channel. I crowdsourced funds to buy my first Canon DSLR and my equipment. And I just started interviewing people. I interviewed an American music video director called Dave Myers. If you know, like Sicko Mo by Drake and... Uh, Travis Scott he directed that he directed Get Your Freak On by Missy Elliott there's just so many people Lionel C. Martin that did Jodeci's videos and Boys to Men Tori Hart Kevin Hart's you know ex I I literally interviewed so many people but as of late it's really become something that I can use to get my music out there I don't really want to use my name on a lot of things especially on social media so Prophets of Rock is just kind of like my protective layer my shell um, but essentially, when you come in, then you'll see the Erica James show, which is my podcast and all platforms. So it's just kind of like my umbrella. It's kind of just like my mantra. And when I lean in with Prophets of Rock, I just feel like I can take anything on. So it's like my my warrior song. <laughs> okay. And so, but as, as, when it comes to doing shows today, um, how is that going? And what types of venues here in the UK are you able to perform? So it gives, just gives, um, you know, people who are, are curious about uh, music and performing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, another question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So the question is, I mean, what what are, what types of venues are you able to do right now? I know you mentioned when you're in university and, and, and doing some performance, but I'm just trying to see if you're trying to break through yeah, the, the land- music scene. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's open mics happening everywhere. It's just about okay. being active and going on like anywhere from Gumtree, Star Now. I know people are using quite a bit. Okay. Um, approaching artists that are not only above your it sounds really awful and I know how you lot did Ebony K Williams in it like above your level but just asking people can I open up for you you know in the time it takes to send an email saying can you listen to my music put your link to your music you'll be shocked I think there's a, a, a video of Tyler the creator going around saying listen I listened to Orange County when they had six views on YouTube so you never know who's listening so it's just about being active and approaching people. I, I'll i still, if I have a new idea for a song, take my acoustic guitar and go to an open mic night in like Central or East London or a lot of universities if they're needing singers, et cetera, or just artists in general, just, you know, producing stuff and, and asking them, can I open up for you? You never know what might work. So that's just what I've been doing, just opening up for people, but also doing a lot of open mics, a lot of like lounge things. Um, just finding a way to survive. I know a lot of great singers that are doing even wedding circuits. You're in the early part of your music. That's how you craft 
your performance. Don't don't be shy about performing anywhere and everywhere. Um, but I'm gearing up to do more shows, but I'm in the creative place now of just writing and, and producing my EP, the next one. And yeah, I can't wait to go back out there and, and perform it. It's it's I'm working on some really cool stuff. Okay. I mean, just as we as we get to wrap up, the you mentioned also being a producer. How does one produce um, in in you know in twenty twenty three when you're not going to rec- recording studio or is that what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I produce myself, but I also use producers. In the early days, I was literally just using GarageBand. Even Steve Lacey, he's like literally Grammy nominated on GarageBand. You can use Fruit Loops, you can use Logic. I use Logic as well. Um, I know it can be quite pricey, so I would just recommend continuing to work or using your friends perhaps. But, you know, literally everyone from like Doja Cat to Steve Lacey started off in their bedroom. A lot of us started off doing music in our bedrooms. Mm. But just look out there for like affordable studios if you want to improve the quality so yeah I would just say continue doing that that's what I'm doing but after a while you get sick of being the only like woman in a room full of mandem (laughs) you know you want to be able to sometimes just have your own space and so I had to learn how to produce because I wasn't going to be told what my vision for my song should be Mm -hmm. I can make anything from country music in the morning to a hip-hop song at night so being able to produce yourself allows you to really extend your talents so yeah I would say to anybody here just try and learn how to to make music use the internet and and learn how and also get your get your writing together if writing isn't your strength work with another songwriter if singing isn't your strength work with a singer but just be really really relentless that's we're all in the same boat whether you're American or British so Mm -hmm. you just have to keep on going yeah, I mean, just finally, when it comes to success or or um, being signed, are there independent labels here in the UK that you, that you might that you would look at and think, okay, if they get to see what I have to do, that they can get me and push me up on more mainstream? Um, are there are there avenues for black artists here? Because we, as I said, outside of say grime and and mm. and hip hop, which seems to be across both here in the UK and the US. That seems to be where the, the labels are investing their money in because they see it's an easy reach and 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 stuff. Yeah. Um, we do have Flo who have oh, sort of made that. it made it across in the US, but it's mm-hmm. it's still very rare um, to to have R and B um, arts uh, artists, you know. Because look at um, even Chloe who signed to Beyonce, she's yeah, not so doing the numbers. I mean, she's she's doing the performances, but she's not doing the numbers that you would expect. So. Um, what what is it that you especially starting locally before you think internationally? What what where, where do you think could be your avenues? Are the labels you think you're looking at and think if they get to understand what I have got, we can make something happen? Absolutely. I mean, there's so many things to unpack, and I hope I can just remember everything. Um, yeah, I think like we mentioned, there was Uptown, there was the Face. There's still labels here that are black labels under oh. big distributors. Mm-hmm. You can just Google them um, <laughs> and you'll see there's just there's many. But we just have to be careful once again of making sure that when we get these labels together and when we're, you know, we're not doing what other people are doing, because then why are you there? Mm-hmm. You know, if Andre Harrell got that opportunity and was just signing the same people that other people were signing, there'd be no Mary J. Blige. There would be no. And I say them because everything comes from them. I'm sorry. Like, I, like I always will have to talk about Devante and Jodeci and these people because we'll just forget them and they should never be like forgotten. So there are people in this country that care. And that's why we've got like Flo who are incredible um, and they're signed, you know, and yeah, you just have to be proactive. But yeah, I mean, even for me, I've had independent interest and in, you just have to be able to offer me something that I can't offer by myself but at the moment I'm really a one-stop shop and I know how to get out there but it's still worth listening to people that are independent and independent labels so they're out there 100% I can you know hit me up if I want to I'll tell you (laughs) (laughs) um, about it all the artists out there there are people and there are independent 
And that's almost like the best way to go sometimes. Um, but then try your luck. I mean, didn't Joe to see hop in a car from North Carolina to New York, not knowing anyone and sit in Uptown's reception for six hours. I mean, try your luck, um, but just be steadfast and, and keep going. And about Chloe, like, this isn't even to you because you, you look at your platform, you love R&B and you support it. I think Chloe did amazing as a debut R&B artist. And I think that even though Janet Jackson had the Jackson name, it took her four albums to get to Rhythm Nation and it took her amazing producers like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis to really pull out of her this even more incredible artist. So I think that time is going to just do so well for Chloe and so many others. But she did a sold out show. She's doing sold out shows. She's had the success of her and her sister as well. She's doing movies. And I think sometimes the expectation people have for Black, especially female artists, is just not the same as other artists. And she's doing that. And she's doing really, really well. And I love In Pieces. I think that album is just so amazing. Like, I can't get that melody of a lot of those songs out of my head. And I just think that she she should just always feel like a success. Her and her sister, Hallie, they're killing it. And yeah, they're just amazing. I would love to write with her, actually. Mm-hmm. I just think I can just see, you know, where she's going. And yeah, definitely. I think in this country in particular, listen, I've reached out to Kay Michelle for this and had a bit of chat online with her. She, I won't say the label, she was even told, in this country, we they don't sign black female artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing with Yola, who's amazing. She was in the Elvis film and she's an Americana, black British artist. She was told the same thing. Nobody wants to sign a girl, black girl with a guitar. I employ everyone to research drone armor trading. I employ everyone to listen to Tracy Chapman. I employ everyone to listen to Desiree, who went through the same thing. She's from South London as well. I've spoken back and forth with Desiree, of all people um, online. And I just said, thank you, because they did the same thing to you in the 90s, saying, where did we put her? And then she Mm -hmm. came out with the song, You Can't Move Me From My Race, from my agency. So, you know, you're always going to be told you don't fit in if you're, you know, look like this, but you should sound like this. You just have to keep going and... I've just realized that there's probably no particular box for me. So I have to create it, which is why I'm thinking of starting a lot of stuff, whether it's a label or, you know, anything, because I know that there are other artists where I'm at Mm. that, you know, I just have this uniqueness to them and we're going to be heard by any means. Okay. So Erica, over the next six to eight, uh, 10 months, what should we be looking out for and expecting from you? Gosh, you just, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta wait, you know, you gotta wait. Great, great things take time, but I hear it and I feel it. And I, I appreciate all the support. I'm always having people hit me up, whether on my uh, Instagram prophets of rock or my DM saying, listen, I like your voice and I like your music, just new music, new music. I will always love a good cover. I love being able to play around with these songs that people know you know, which is why I do a lot of covers on TikTok as well, on Prophets of Rock TikTok, but just a lot more new music and just doing things that haven't been done before. I don't know how to listen to the radio and say, I want to make this. I just always will look at new things and bring certain sounds to the foreground, whether it's like something I've heard that has a Saudi Arabian vibe. I love to travel. So I'm always pulling different sounds that I hear and filtering it through my unique lens. So just new music, some film things, some acting things that I can't really talk about too much, but like just a lot more, a lot more of me to come. Okay. I mean, one, one would think that if you worked in radio right now, you're able to, you, you are able to sneak in your, your songs. Is that ever possible? It don't work like that. Nah. Uh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't work like that at all. It doesn't work like that at all. And I work ad hoc. So I just want to, say that as well um but yeah it, it doesn't work like that and I have too much um respect for the way that it's set up mm-hmm. you know very often they yeah it just it just it doesn't work like that you would think that even unscripted and scripted because I've worked a lot in tv even more so that you can just cross over to scripted so unscripted is like a love island scripted is like friends if people don't know 
the the media industry and the music industry are just seas apart so you know I'm closer but I still have to have respect for the process and you still have to work your way work your way in but we in there <laughs> we in there <laughs> okay so um here she comes so that's out now where can people uh download or purchase it yes yeah, so here she comes is my ep i produced it i vocal produced it i mixed i mastered it and distributed it myself you can hear it on spotify you can hear it on amazon you can hear it apple music just literally anywhere that you usually listen to music um, you can listen to it. It's a vibe. It's raw. It's acoustic. It's meant to be that way. It's just, it's real rock and roll. I can't guarantee you that it's, my next project is going to sound like that. If you can guess it, I'm not doing it right. So it's it's just real and raw and just comes straight from my, my soul. Would you ever consider collaborating with a veteran US R&B acts on stuff that you can write and produce? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always thinking of like, God, what KC would sound really good on this? <laughs> Jojo's sweet melodic voice will sound great on this. Oh, I wish I could show this to Dalvin and, you know, Devante. And, you know, I'm always thinking, oh God, Missy or even Beyonce, you know, I've, that's another story. I've, I've met Beyonce. I've gone to a taping. I remember when she did Full in 2011, she was just like feeling very generous because she would just host free shows and performances and I did an ITV taping where I was in the audience and got to like meet her very 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 briefly in the dances so I've studied her voice since I was a kid like I said literally going from school to see Destiny's Child with my sisters and do signings and things so I think Beyonce I mean that's on everyone's bucket list to be fair you know but Brandy as well is a huge influence of mine I've done a meet and greet and met her and told her the same thing me and my sister and her were just like crying and <laughs> saying we love you we love you you know so I would love to just work with her I think she's the singer's singer and she just has an amazing voice but even like Kings of Leon and Robin I don't know if many people know her but well you should do because dancing on my own is like the biggest song ever <laughs> I just would love to work with her and you know I would have loved to have worked with Prince but you know, Janelle Monet is also another person I would love to work with. I think Janelle is just incredible, incredible, incredible. I love her new video, Lipstick Lover, which I know is <laughs> causing quite a stir. But I think any repressed <laughs> person that grew up, you know, is just like, yes, Janelle, give it, give it take it. You know, I just love her. And yeah, I think she's incredible. Age of Pleasure. I can't wait to listen to that album. So I'm a fan. I think. I'm a fan of music and I have to keep pushing myself like, yo, you have talent. So go in and do music. And, you know, I just think writing is always something that I, I've loved to do, but also singing. So mm. look out, look out for everything. Well, Eric, it was definitely been great um, having you on and listening Thank to you. your story, your journey, especially as I mentioned here in the UK, just understanding the difference between how, um, our, our independent art, artists here in the UK um, are able to make make some waves and, and, and move forward and we definitely will be looking forward to seeing more of your things so thank you as you said if people want to follow you so that they won't be looking for Erica James they should be looking for Prophet of Rock yes I mean you can type in Erica James but you're just going to get 500 other Erica Jameses <laughs> okay, okay. they're white so no <laughs> just to make it like really selective you can put Erica James, but I would say Prophets of Rock, not Prophet, Prophet of Rock. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and you can see it on YouTube, Prophets of Rock TV. I make a lot of short films as well, one of which um, was shown by Channel 4. It's called Stars. So check mm. it out. It's a three minute short film. It's like my baby. I love that. I, I listen I, I listen and watch my work okay <laughs> you get better Beyonce does it too okay uh, <laughs> and um yeah TikTok same thing Profits of Rock no spaces no uppercases uh Instagram as well I'm always posting not only my music but my podcast as well on all platforms check it out Profits of Rock Erica James that's just that's the vibe that's what we're doing that's what we're on <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been great speaking to you, Erica. And, and you uh, too. Thank you. I love your I love your content so much. Like you just are just keeping R and B alive. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate that. Yes, but um, hence the need to try and really branch out and and really shine a, a light on 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 British, um, especially Black British music and artists as well. Of course, because you know I grew up listening to Eternal. And I'm saying all these things. I was like two, mind you. <laughs> but I grew up listening to Eternal and the Honeys. And, you know, when, you know, I'm sure you know the story of them wanting like a British and Vogue and having Eternal. So America and the UK have always kind of been simultaneous. The pictures of like fans holding up their like Adidas or their Nike trainers when Run DMC were performing at Wembley over here. So, you know, we do have that scene and it just needs to be tapped into and given attention to. And if they're not giving attention, we need to take it. Yeah. <laughs> and give you freedom. No, definitely. Well, definitely, Erica. So, guys, the Profits of Rock, uh, if you search that on all media. And, um, you know, we definitely look forward to seeing bigger and um, better things for America. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs>